Sam, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining, uh, joining us. Um, our university is now quiet, silent. There's not very many of us here. Um, just some faculty who are running some courses. I just swung by Dr. Patterson's office. He's got, he's lecturing through Zoom and he's got his student graduate assistant monitoring the chat so that they can take questions at any moment. So as you know, um, everybody is scrambling a little and with PhysioU, we're hoping that we will be, be able to alleviate some of the stress and some of the pain and minimize the disruption to students. Uh, just so you know, um, I have Dr. Manny Young from Sacred Heart. He's joining us and he will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions or you want to speak in at any point, please feel free. Manny's just going to stop me every so often and jump in with some comments or questions. But I really want to honor our time and um, share a little bit about what, uh, what we have in PhysioU that you may be able to leverage in your online classroom. So uh, without further ado, I would also say that many faculty who are now currently online teaching have asked that we record this webinar. So we're going to record it and then we'll repost it so that everybody can have access to it. Um, also, for those of you, um, I believe you this presentation as well as the PDF has been posted. Um, it is. I'm just going to double check that it is where I think it is. Hang on one second. So at PhysioU under educator. There should be some free resources here. One of the free resources that um, hang on one second. Where are my free resources? There they are. One of the free resources, uh, here are your PowerPoint for today, the PDF, as well as a clinical pattern recognition worksheet that we use, and then a PhysioU master cheat sheet. So all of this I'll explain in a second, but I just want you to know that if you wanted to follow along on the PDF, you could go to physioU.com under educator, and here are the free resources. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started. Um, Sam, you're able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I would just, I just want to introduce myself brief, briefly. I've been here at Azusa Pacific University for going on 17 years now. So I've been teaching in entry level for the last 17 years. And my content area started with modalities and therapeutic exercises and orthopedics. And now I'm primarily focused on teaching the entire orthopedic track. Um, here at the university, I'm a teaching and learning fellow. I teach, uh, I did my orthopedic residency and fellowship through Kaiser and now teach for the Kaiser residency and fellowship, as well as the USC spine fellowship in which we use the apps, uh, as a way to disseminate clinical practice guidelines. And the last six or seven years have really been focused around rethinking educational tools that can enhance learning. Um, and also at the university, I chair the Institutional Review Board. So I've been a little bus busy and now we are even crazy busier um, as all of you are experiencing the same shift to the online, online model. So I want to give you a glimpse of what PhysioU is and why we did it. So we noticed that for our students, the graduate ed education cost just continues to skyrocket. And I noticed that there were many textbooks that I, I had the students order that I just didn't find to be as useful as I needed. And so I began to think about, wow, all these kids are carrying iPads and iPhones. I wonder if there's a new way to disseminate information. Now, I still use textbooks in my classroom because I believe that there are certain things, certain depth of information you cannot get from the apps. The apps were not developed for that but they were developed to be an adjunct in the classroom. Sorry, uh, Michael, would you, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Would you uh, please ask everyone to uh, mute themselves? Yes. So that, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. If everybody- Unless they have a question. Yep, unless you have a question, if you wouldn't mind muting your mic, that will make it easier for everybody to listen to. Thank you. 
so resources that get shelved and become out of date is also a com common issue. So the old editions, um, having to buy new editions. This is my little pocket guide that I'm phasing out. Resources that are not mobile. So we found that a lot of students who learned with a certain resource, they would chuck it or put it on the shelf when I wanted them to reference it at any point in time during the orthopedic class. So we use the app to reference manual muscle test and palpation because they learned that in the first semester. Or modalities, we use the app to reference the modalities because I want to kind of link all that content in my orthopedic class. There's also a lack of high quality video driven resources to help with the motor learning. So particular to our profession, there's so many skills that we teach. Is the best way to teach it the first time they see it in lab? So that is one of the one of the reasons why we really focused on trying to have high quality video filmed with clinical specialists. And then the lack of resources to create context. So for me, one of the biggest challenges that I was having in entry level was I was delivering a lot of the content in small silos, in pieces. But without the big picture, a lot of this just began to clutter their minds. It was really hard for them to pull it all together. So I will also share with you how I utilize the apps to create context, which then allows for the detailed information delivery in labs to make a lot more sense. Uh, as you can see, there's a growing list of faculty and experts who are building these apps with us. And so rest assured, these are all clinical specialists who are who who we were filming and also because of the nature of the product we are constantly refilming based on feedback from faculty so just this week we filmed 10 different videos for range of motion just to clean it up a little based on feedback from some of our faculty so it can it keeps getting better as people use it and give us feedback and the students just get the updates for free so the main objectives for today is to give you a glimpse of what PhysioU is and what apps are currently available. Really, it is a, it's a software platform that is going to cover a lot of the content in most entry-level programs, PT and PTA. Then I want to chat about three main problems that PhysioU can assist with as you're moving your coursework online. And then three simple ways to leverage PhysioU into your interactive online classroom. So PhysioU, what you'll see in a second is all of you have, will have or already have full faculty access. We want you to be able to pull this up anytime you are in your online classroom and be able to open up an app and illustrate things or concepts or techniques at any time to make it very simple for the faculty. You don't need to film these. You don't need to sort them, name them, edit them, and host them in your Google Drive. A lot of it is already sorted out for you in a relatively easy user interface. So there's a lot of different apps here that I will show you in a second. Now, since 2013, we have been evolving and developing these apps. These are all the orthopedic apps. It took a year just to build low back pain. And all of these apps are built on the clinical practice guidelines. So as a resource, you can be rest assured, I myself am one of the guideline writers for JSPT and the orthopedic, uh, the Academy of Orthopedic uh, Physical Therapy. So all of the guidelines, orthopedic guidelines are built directly into these apps. And you can see as we move further out of orthopedics, we started hitting range of motion manual muscle tests, neuro, gait, cardiopulmonary rehab. This is the orthopedic app in its entirety. Uh, we, we released special tests, assistive devices. We're releasing a therapeutic exercises app that you can use for patients as well as for the classroom. PNF, we, we built with Kaiser Vallejo. We will be releasing it this summer. And we released a splinting app, you know, a developmental milestones app. Uh, we have a number of apps, medical screening app that's coming out. Um, all of these, some of these are in development. A lot of them are already ready for you to utilize in the classroom. Any, any comments or questions?
Mike, I think uh, for some individuals who have their phone, yes. uh, they can use their phone as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So these apps are mobile friendly, meaning they will scale to be used on your any browser on your phone, on your laptop, on your iOS device, iPad. Uh, and the reason we moved to web, which is the re direction a lot of these softwares are moving, is because there's a lot more flexibility in how easy it is for us to update, to add new videos, to add new types of apps that I'll show you a, a little further on. So three main challenges. Three main challenges for the online learning environment. So motor skill development has been a big conversation. Sorry, give me one second here. And let me try to... There we go. So uh, motor skill development has been a big conversation amongst all of us. I don't know if that's the same case for, for all of you. What are we going to do with labs? So um, some of us in the earlier part of this meeting, while we were waiting for everyone to join on, had talked about um, having students practice on a loved one, a roommate, or a classmate that they feel comfortable getting together with. I think that is actually, I think we do have to be kind of neutral about it. We should neither encourage it nor, nor discourage it. But I do think that the students, it reduces their anxiety that they can kind of be together and work on stuff together. So this is something that we've kind of been doing as well, neither encouraging or discouraging it because they do have to practice these skills. And I'll talk about what we're doing at APU in a second. I also want to talk about creating engagement in your online classroom. Some of the tools we have in PhysioU that you can just pull up at any moment to create an environment for discussion. And then lastly, to talk about how I'm using the orthopedic apps to create big picture context as a scaffold for deep learning. What I find in orthopedics is there's so many tests and techniques and exercises. There's so many mini pieces that if I don't create the big picture early, they get lost and it gets more lost as each joint, as we go from each joint to joint. So imagine now being online, how easy it is to be disconnected from the big picture. So I really want to share that with you today. So motor skill development in the online space. I would encourage you, many of you who are already thinking about this, that some of the literature out there has actually been done heavily in the nursing environment in which they have huge classes. There's key skills that need to be taught. So in this systematic review, the good news is that there is no, uh, the online learning method for teaching clinical skills is no less effective than the traditional means. Meaning I think we can get through this, okay. I think we just kind of have to be a little bit targeted um, in the way that we do this and kind of be a little bit specific, um, be a little bit specific on how we direct the students to develop their motor skills and how we're gonna test it. Here also what you see is another article talking about using video podcasts. So using these little video techniques, this is uh, related to the core apps. Uh, uh, one of my friends and colleagues who built the core apps, these are actually a very nice library of orthopedic special test, and they found that the video clips were easily viewed, downloadable, they were perceived as highly valuable in learning the special test, and it was deemed to be convenient and flexible. Um, so you could use it and the students could carry it from classroom all the way into the clinic. So this is also why we have the same orthopedic special test, the manual therapy techniques, the therapeutic exercises, all of that, I think, built into small chunks that are easily accessible based on the need of the student in that moment. I think that's a really critical component about these mobile tools. Um, I'm going to invite Manny, actually. So what you see here is uh, Manny Young is a, a professor uh, at Sacred Heart University, and he has utilize the PhysioU videos to augment his lab handout. Manny, do you want to just speak into this for a moment? Sure. Thank you, Mike. So what I have is a template of what we use in the lab. So this is the neck uh, 
uh, intervention lab that I teach. So for example, at PhysioU, there's a video showing the upglides. So I grab that link when you're logged on to the With video. With your patient in supine, gently lift her head off the table and use your abdomen to help hold the head in that position, allowing the muscles to relax. With your right hand, apply a lateral translation or side glide force to the left while applying an anterior to posterior translation through the chin. Using your second met head or your PIP, apply an up glide superior to anterior force at that same level. When a barrier is felt, apply a high velocity, low amplitude thrust in the up glide direction. Again, laterally translate, anterior to posterior, find your barrier with a superior to anterior, and apply a grade five technique. I mean, certainly some of these more complex techniques, I think, demand a little bit more focus, but there's plenty of techniques that are relatively straightforward that the videos can help to really supplement and students can start learning on their own. But go ahead, Manny. Yes, thank you, Mike. So um, what I did was to grab each of the video link. Once you log into PhysioU, you'd be able to get to the URL and click on the link to copy that and paste it here, for example, at the upglide section. And that video link I converted to, you know, just edit the hyperlink to name the technique that you want it to be named. So that's what I did for all the procedures that I taught um, in my lab template. So the students just have to click on the link and then they can see the video and below the video at PhysioU are all the instructions. So they don't have to feverishly cop, you know, write down or take notes of what I'm trying to teach them while they're learning the technique, all they need to do is focus on looking at how the technique is performed. But with this online um, environment, they could just look at the video, you know, as we go. And what I'm showing you here is, again, it's at physio.physio.com under faculty resources. What we are creating for you right now as we speak is a master list of all the techniques in the Neuro Exam app, in the CardioPalm app, in the Range of Motion MMT app, in the Ortho app, transfers and assistive devices. And so all the techniques have the URLs directly there for you to cut and paste. So you really can just do a scan of what you need and start cutting and pasting it into your lab handouts or your LMS, whatever, whatever you so choose. So that's available for you, and we decided that that would be the fastest and easiest way for you to just find what you need. Um, we are working on releasing a search function in the app, so you could find it that way, but right now we are creating this for all faculty. It's this master cheat sheet for all the videos in PhysioU. All right. Thank you, Manny. So yes, that's what we're doing as well in our lab handouts. We're augmenting all the videos so that all the lab sheets, so that students know and can view the techniques before they come to class or before they see it online. You can see for the cardiopulmonary app, all the techniques you would typically teach in the cardiopulmonary class from exam to interventions, all of them have been filmed already. So your lab is essentially prepared and ready to go. So you have all of these videos and a cardiopalm specialist performing all the techniques. Assistive devices is the same way. We, our faculty decided that it was really hard for the students to learn about fitting and gait training and transfers by reading about it. And so we decided to film all the common assistive device fittings, the gait patterns, the stairs using going up and down stairs with the different devices, bed mobility, sit to stand, stand to sit, and transfers, including wheelchair fitting and wheelchair mobility. All of that is our videos that you can just utilize. You can literally show the video, discuss it together with your students online, and then if they have access to the tools, they can try it themselves. So that is, for example, here, the gate patterns, modified three-point gate, front wheel walker. We filmed it for both the right and the left lower extremity so that students could then eventually share these with the, their patients. 
So the students will watch this ahead of time. And then when you need to show it online and talk about the video, you can then nuance from your clinical expertise different things that you would watch out for, things that you want to see, and hopefully they will have a chance to practice this. But at least they don't have to just look at pictures and try to visualize how this, how this works. So let me move back here. So you can see all the videos with instructions. So there's advantages of, of this type of gate, the description of the gate, the instructions on how to do it. All of that is available. Here's the Neuro Exam app, also very useful for your neuro class. So you can imagine all the testing that you would have done in your face-to-face -face class. Now they can watch it online ahead of time. So in this app here, you will see that these are all the examination techniques. And Rachel Tabak Tran, Tran, who was the director of neuroresidency at Casa Kalina, um, she basically, we organized this and filmed the entire thing. So if you said, guys, this week in neuro, we are learning about balance. Here are the four or 10 tests that I want you to watch ahead of time before we look at them together in class. So here's your five times sit to stand. There's the video describing how the test is done and you get to watch as the person performs the test. With your arms folded across your chest, stand up and sit down five times as fast as you can. And of course, the setup, the patient position, the cues for how it's done, and the normative values and interpretations, and links to references. So you can see we've done that to make the neuro class a lot easier for the students to learn. So a lot of that they will watch ahead of time before we discuss it and show the videos in class and then give more context as we're doing the online discussions. So this includes, of course, all the diagnosis specific, stroke, spinal cord injury. So we've got Fugelmeyer and Stream, Asia, vestibular, the cranial nerve exam. So neuro exam here is relatively complete for your neuro examination class. When it comes to the interventions, we have a number of different resources that are coming. PNF should be out by summer, early summer. Um, we are working closely with Sarah Kraft at uh, Medical University of South Carolina. She has an amazing resource that even today we are working with their programmers to see if we can get access for you faculty and for the students in which many of the interventions, including patient examination, so watching a patient being examined, all of that we're hoping to get out to you as soon as we can. Manny, are there any comments? I noticed there are a lot of little chats going on. Yes, um, during the Q&A, we can go over some of them. Okay, all right, so I'll just keep moving along then. So you can see the Neuro Exam app. Again, very useful for you to just link into your lab handout or into your LMS. They use the URLs and the students can just watch it in real time uh, as they prepare for labs. So the classes that we have content for, Pretty much all the stuff you're going to teach in cardiopulmonary rehab, from examination to intervention to case studies, all of that is available. A really powerful app. Our students have given it really good feedback because it's an area that many do not have good, good experience with. So we use cardiopulmonary rehab to build, build clinical patterns and connect interventions and examinations together. The MSK, the orthopedic app, that's my area of uh, expertise that is the biggest app in the in the whole suite and it is fairly comprehensive there's the bulk of the things you're going to teach in terms of manual therapy techniques therapeutic exercises common taping um, all the special tests the best special test all of that is there but it's not just a library I'll show you later it is actually there's some logic built into the flow of the examination the treatment, the education, all of that is kind of connected. There's also a special test app uh, avail avail available for you for easy access to find the test that you need. The Range of Motion MMT Palpation and Neuroscreen, also a very popular app because it, I mean, 
how many people like to read about learning range of motion or learning manual muscle test? How much quicker can you do it just by observing and then trying it out? So this is what actually our instructor is teaching right now uh, in his office. Uh, the neurologic exam, the assisted devices, and then splint building. So building splints uh, for your prosthetic orthotic class or your splint building class, that is also a really useful app um, for your online classroom. So what are we doing at APU for virtual labs? So students have access to all of these techniques that they're being taught for that week. So the beauty of PhysioU is the students get it from the first day they enter the program and they have it for the first year when they're done graduating from the program. So they are able to access these resources and instructors can access this resource at any point in time. So the other thing that I would say is that the students can pre-watch the videos before lab. So guys, we're doing shoulder range of motion or shoulder MMT today. Or guys in ortho, we're going to do shoulder. So I need you to play through the app and look at the techniques that we're going to do. The faculty will demonstrate the techniques live via, via Zoom. And so what we have is a webcam set up. The faculty is demonstrating the techniques. And a graduate assistant is manning the camera as well as manning the chat to get feedback from the students to answer questions. Because as you know, when you're live on Zoom, it's really hard to keep track of too many things. The questions and conversations happen in real time via streaming. They are then encouraged to practice the skills on their partner, roommate, or classmate. And then we are having them sign up for virtual 15-minute checkoffs. So the students are going to meet with the graduate assistant on FaceTime or, or you know, Google Hangouts, whatever you might end up using. And they are being told that they need to demonstrate the techniques that they have just been taught. So there is this kind of, even though it's virtual and we used to do this face to face, we are still having some type of virtual checkoff going on. The students have reported that it's still useful to get some feedback, to get a little bit of that interaction. So I think that's a little bit of the magic sauce for all of us who are moving things online. You have to have a pretty fine balance between what is asynchronous and kind of non-interactive to some amount of interaction with the faculty. And then you can spread yourself and kind of increase your virtual land, landmark, so to speak, by using, utilizing your graduate assistants to give them feedback on basic skills. When it comes to final exams, we're up a creek, just like everybody else. Um, we have talked about having a faculty member in one faculty member in each of five rooms and bringing in a student or two so that there's never a larger group than two or three to run that. But we are hoping to push that off for at least a month or two. So I think that's just a, something that we're, we're all trying to figure out. All right, so moving on to number two, creating engagement in your online classroom. One of the perks of what we've tried to build is you can minimize your hunting for videos on YouTube or you trying to film videos of yourself and organizing it and then trying to find it when you need it. So for example, if you look at the gate app, in our minds we said there's got to be a better way to teach people about movement than to just look at black and white pictures. There's got to be a better way to look at deviations than to just tell them about it and find some random video online. And so what we've tried to do with the gate app is then create and capture lots of videos that you need to teach basic gate to translate what are once static images into moving images, EMG, range of motion. These are all captured in our, in our movement analysis lab. And then to capture real patients that have real pathology and then create, you know, we write some information, associated phase, what are some of the causes or penalties of this, this gate pattern. And I'm going to move here to this point here. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Tyler Schultz out of Wingate. And he um, partnered with us to create some case studies for the prosthetics and orthotics. I'm just going to let him 
speaking here. My name is Tyler Schultz. I'm an assistant professor at Wingate University, and I was involved in developing the prosthetic gait modules on PhysioU. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about how I've used those in the classroom. Um, one of the main ways that I've used this in the classroom is um, to have students pre-study before they come in and learn gait deviations for a prosthetic user. And what we've found in the past is videos have been helpful for this, but a lot of the videos hadn't really been updated since the late 80s or early 90s. So they didn't lend themselves well to a more HD environment or a more interactive environment that our students are used to. So we filmed the, the videos um, here for PhysioU under Analyze Deviations and then Prosthetics. So in the classroom, I have the students go through and review these on their own prior to class. So tr both transtibial and transfemoral. And really what I want them to do is just get exposed and get accustomed to what are they looking at, how are looking at it from the, you know, both the left, right, and then also from the uh, anterior, posterior views. And I'm less concerned that they memorize all this information as opposed to just starting to see the information on their screen, on their phone, or on their computer. Then when we come into class, I can go back through and discuss these points in a little bit more detail. And then we can also go through in the gate app and go into our case studies and apply these case studies um, in more of a clinical reasoning type scenario. So we can take our 28 year old male with instability. We can look at a, We can watch a video of him ambulating from all those same views that we've already seen. Now these are these are the same videos that the students have already pre-studied from, but they're blinded as to which uh, which video it is. So they have to go back and actually reanalyze this individual's gait. And then from that, they get a little bit uh, additional information in terms of amputation level, um, occupation, complaints, past medical history, and so on. And then we can go through this. Um, I usually do one or two in the class just to give them an idea of how to use the interface and what types of things we're looking for from a clinical reasoning perspective. And then I'll break them into groups and have them go through the rest of the case studies on their own. Um, and then we come back as a big group and go over the clinical reasoning for each case. So this uh, uh, allows us to hit those major clinical reasoning points um, for each of these cases and apply those gate deviations that they have pre-studied for and that we've talked as a, as a class and now we're going through application and clinical reasoning. Uh, the other thing that the case studies are really beneficial for is creating that context in the classroom. So without bringing in an actual amputee who can demonstrate these gait deviations, and in all honesty, most of our volunteers come in, they have a really well-working prosthesis, so they don't have too many gait deviations to begin with. Um, so until you actually see someone ambulate with instability, it kind of doesn't hit home fully for the students. So by being able to play these videos, talk about the phase of gait, talk about what I'm seeing as a clinician with them as this person ambulates, creates a lot more clinical context for them and allows them to actually see what I'm seeing um, and, and really point out that this is pistoning in the socket and that's likely the cause of the individual uh, having some feelings of instability as they ambulate. So, so you kind of get a glimpse here of how we are utilizing the case studies as a way to take gait analysis really into a clinical environment where we could say, hey, what do you think we should adjust? What do you think are impaired uh, that we need to examine in the orthopedic environment? Um, the other thing that we just released that I think will be very useful for you in your online classroom is developmental milestones. So we tried to follow the same baby every month of his first year of life. And so what you get to see then is videos that you can utilize to make observations and look at atypical development. So all of this then becomes your online tool that students can go back home and study again. So this will include all the motor milestones, uh, zero through 12 months. 
and also your reflexes. And we are working now on releasing cases, so different babies with different pathologies so that you can use that as discussion tools in class. Of, co of course, that's a lot more sensitive and a little bit more difficult to film, but we do have some that we're working on releasing. So that's developmental milestones. In the, um, in the, the other thing we're about to release, this is something that Dr. Edie Kendall out of Plymouth has been working on with us and another professor, uh, Brian Cleveley out of University of Idaho. This is a uh, gamifying movement analysis. So using the Edinburgh visual gait analysis score, the students will watch a number of different children in the virtual environment and they will then be able to circle around the child, do the gait analysis, score it, and then look at how their score was compared to their classmate and also compared to a key. So a kind of a standardized way to do gait analysis. This will be available probably within the next week. Actually, this morning, myself and the programmers were looking at it and getting it ready for release. So you can see these are just new and different ways for us to engage the student and have them develop a habit of systematic movement analysis. And it makes it kind of fun too. So you could certainly do this together in class. And then there's a number of different patients that they can now play through and you can just assign that. Um, in the cardiopulmonary app, one of my colleagues, Tony Iwakawa out of Toro, has been using the cardiopulmonary case studies because we purposely built in some... I'm sorry, Mike. Yes. Um, whoever's phone number is 787-319-4528, please mute your phone. Yeah, if possible. Sorry, thank, thank you. Thank you. Whoever's phone number is 787-319-4528, please mute your phone. Mike, are you able to mute on your end too? Uh, not in this case. Okay. Okay. Yes, thank you. And so what you see is in the case studies here, in the cardiopulmonary app, you have a patient that will tell a story. My legs are swollen. I'm short of breath. I'm not sure what's going on. And so here, you will see that there is a basic case that the students can now go and discuss together. You can break them up in your Zoom little breakout rooms. Go ahead and discuss the case together. And here are your examination and some clinical reasoning questions. And the answers are here hidden and also linked into the PhysioU apps. Here are some common reported findings, risk factors. So um, the students and the, and the faculty can now play out some of these key cases to really give context to what the patient looks like, what kind of intervention and examination strategies that you want to use, um, what are some other differential diagnosis that you might want to consider when someone, uh, let's say someone has leg pain and they have peripheral arterial disease. So these are some cases that faculty are using in their cardiopulm class as well as their multiple systems class as a way to just have interactions online and face-to-face. -face. Okay, so these are available to you as well. Okay, let me take you through the last point here that I want to make for the day, and then we could just kind of open it up for questions. To me, in orthopedics and in cardiopulmonary, uh, I, neuro as well, pretty much all of our clinical courses, seeing the big picture, I think is really critical for helping students manage the volume of the techniques and tests and interventions. So you can see here, everyone's feeling a little a little bit of something. They have their anatomy class, their range of motion class, their orthopedic exam class, and interventions in a different course, TheraX in a different course, multiple systems. And we're hoping that at the end of the program, when they get in, out into the clinic and are seeing 15 patients a day, that they're going to be able to pull this together. What I really believe is that it is important to create scaffolds, cognitive maps for them, to be able to categorize based on the main ICF categories, the main patterns that they're going to see for low back pain, for example. And then 
when they see how these different patients present and the rehab and examination strategy for each of them, it allows the lab to make so much more sense because everything that you teach in lab can now be associated to a pattern that they recognize. So how do you use clinical pattern recognition to build context? In the online discussion environment, what I usually do is I invite the students at the beginning of class, I invite the students to share. I want them to be engaged into the learning experience. So I ask them, hey guys, so related to shoulder problems, what are some of the common shoulder problems that you have seen before or that, you're, that you think we're going to learn about this week? So the students will start shouting out frozen shoulder, calcific tendonitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, all of these different names, and I list them down on an open PowerPoint. So I start writing down these, these conditions. On another column, I basically ask them to match it to an appropriate ICF category. So they'll say, oh, frozen shoulder, that is a mobility deficit, right? Because they know that when we talk about mobility deficits, there is a relatively clear examination strategy, range of motion, active and passive, accessory mobility, and tissues that cross the joint that might limit motion. They know that there's an examination that is consistent with mobility deficits, whether it's at your knee or your elbow or your ankle or your shoulder. And they also know that because the key impairment is range of motion, then the intervention is largely manual therapy and exercise that improve the range of motion. So you can see that as we progress from joint to joint, when we associate the pathologies and conditions to the ICF category, half the battle is already won. They have some idea of the examination and treatment strategy. Now you're just going to fill in the dots. So that's what I mean here by accessing and validating previously acquired knowledge when the students feel like something that they know is relevant and you can build on that it is so much more powerful as you layer on the next the next layer of knowledge i also make a point to play through two or three of these patterns weekly i'm going to show you what i mean by that and the students can now fill out a clinical clinical pattern development worksheet now Having talked to many of you, many of you are doing something similar. They create tables of conditions, signs and symptoms, impairments, movement faults. That's fantastic. I have shared with you one version of what I've created that you can utilize. You can utilize it any way you want or modify it any way you want. But let me just give you a glimpse here in the orthopedic app. So when you log in as faculty, so when you go to physiou.com and you click sign in, you will be brought to the page where all the apps exist. Okay, lines and tubes, splinting. So as we develop new apps, the students just get new apps. So that's the benefit of subscribing to the PhysioU suite of apps. When you choose in the orthopedic app, let's just say shoulder, Oftentimes, I will play pain patterns with them. I'll engage them. Hey, so the patient has sharp pinching pain at the tip of their shoulder. Any hypotheses? What do you think it could be? Oh, maybe like AC joint sprain or subacromial pain syndrome, shoulder impingement, or maybe some red flags that I want them to kind of be aware of in the back of their mind, even though we're not going to talk about it till later. And when we go in and discover a little bit more, so remember, this is my first day of class. So I'm online with them, I'm chatting with them, and we're going through this together because I want to, I want to open some doors in the app that they would feel too scared to open on their own. They have to see what's in there, and they have to feel that every week. Then they really learn how to utilize the app. So we'll watch a little video of this guy who's complaining of an arc of pain, who's having a faulty movement pattern of excessive internal rotation during elevation, and we get to talk about it a little. What have you seen in your patients who have shoulder impingement, subacromial pain syndrome? What did they act like? Did they have limited range? Did they have apprehension at mid range or at end range? And so we get to have this little conversation. So it's a little video that they get to watch. often complain of subacromial pinching pain, a sharp pain in the subacromial region. From there, I will say, hey, what do you think? What have you seen in the clinic 
that we do to examine this, to examine this problem, and what kind of impairments do you think we should examine? So the students will type in, they will chat in, some of students will just speak in, and I think that's what you guys will find, as many of you are already doing it, students actually like the ability to either speak in or chat in because there's, it feels a little less risky than raising your hand in the classroom. So they'll say, hey, I remember seeing some special test. Which ones? Oh, Nears, Hawkins, Kennedy, great. I'm gonna lump that together in an impingement assessment. Here are some of the tests that you're gonna learn in lab on, on Thursday, or what we're gonna show you on Thursday online. I want you to watch these before you come to class. So the tests here, of course, have their uh, sensitivity and specificity, likelihood ratios, how they work as a test item cluster, the associated ICF categories, and instructions on how to do it, and of course all your citations. Imagine that in this same conversation you can talk about common movement faults, common scapular movement faults, common thoracic, uh, thoracic mobility deficits, right? You can talk about regional interdependence, associated muscle tightnesses, thoracic stiffness, weakness of the rotator cuff or scapular muscles. So all of these we can talk about. These are things that sometimes are really hard for students to follow if we're just talking about it in the cognitive space. But when you can show them an image and say, doesn't it make sense that some of these medial rotators of the humerus, if short, could contribute to a faulty movement pattern. Or a tight posterior capsule might contribute to this particular movement pattern. So my point here is that not only are there clinical reasoning videos that the students are expected to watch because it allows me to trickle in information in a non-threatening environment into their mind, these clinical reasoning videos also contextualize a lot of this content that they see below here and it allows me to talk about a condition in a much more complex way because there is a visual roadmap into my mind into your mind as a clinical specialist essentially we move on from the physical exam to interventions i'll say so you guys talked about when the thoracic thoracic spine is stiff we need to improve that this is something you're going to learn in a couple weeks I'm going to bookmark that for you. Feel free to explore. And if there is accessory motion loss, here are some techniques we're going to learn on, sun, on, on Friday. Here is the grade of evidence from the guidelines. And I want you to watch these before class so that we can try them together. Or when you see me demonstrate it in class, it will not be the first exposure. This is one of the keys. We should have multiple exposures, really graded exposure to the student reduces anxiety and I, I believe will help with mastery of techniques and deeper understanding. And we can go all the way into modalities, patient education, common therapeutic exercises. All of these are linked. Because you can imagine I used to teach a therapeutic exercise class, which was a semester later and nothing was connected. Nothing made sense and all of our CIs said, your students don't understand how to use their X, how to dose their X, when to, you know, we had all of these comments. I think a lot of it is because things are disconnected in their mind. And oftentimes because we often teach it in silos. So you can see a lot of these exercises that they're going to learn in their X. And these are things that you can connect the dots to in that day. Imagine day one of shoulder week for ortho. You have connected all these dots. Half of the stuff they already knew, it was just scattered. But now they see that they can come in here and organize themselves along the way. This is the power of creating context early, the big picture, and then filling in all the techniques later in your labs with the details. I think this could be very, this will be fun for you. As you play through some of these patterns, you don't have to play them all. I usually select two or three. I play through it and interact with the students, ask them what they think, ask them what they have seen. And then every exposure like this helps because their mind becomes a little bit more clear every time they do it. So um, 
I'm just going to give you a glimpse of the worksheet here. The students can fill this out for each common condition. So guys, we're in shoulder week. You have three main common conditions that I really want you to know about. The unstable shoulder, the frozen shoulder, and the shoulder that hurts on the way up and on the way down. The, the muscle power deficit, your subacromial pain syndrome. So I want you to go through and fill out this worksheet because I want you to think as you are playing through the app. So it's a kind of a guided tour. So what body region are you in? Shoulder. What common condition are we going to talk about? Frozen shoulder. What's the ICF category? Now I want you to go and view the clinical findings video. And when they click on that link, now this is just a generic link. It will show a video of someone who has, is playing out the frozen shoulder signs and symptoms. So there's all these little reflections. Watch the clinical reasoning video for physical exam and key findings. What key tests and impairments do you think are associated with this condition? So there's this kind of asynchronous guide to the development of the clinical pattern that you can now build upon when you come into your sync sessions or your lab sessions. You now know that they've played through the app and organized their thoughts some, and they kind of went through a guided tour. So this is something that I have posted and you can feel free to modify or even think about using. So I would just say kind of in closing that we've asked the question of our students, how are these apps helping you in your classroom and in your learning as well as in the clinic? We presented this data at ELC conference in 2018. First off, we found out that when we asked them how many of them are buying the textbooks that we recommend or require, 80% of the students are buying less than 40% of the textbooks required or recommended. So each of us are going to have to decide what is the best medium to get the job done. I still use textbooks, and there are some that I don't use anymore. When we ask them, how did the apps help you? Here are some of the highlights, the ones where we had relatively high, high scores for mastery and confidence of the techniques. I really believe, especially as we move online, that allowing them to have the comfort of knowing that the techniques are in their pocket and that they can watch it ahead of time before they come to lab and they can watch it again after lab is done, that changes the level of anxiety and their ability to master these techniques. The, the graded exposure is important. They feel more prepared for clinic. I think it's because when they play through the patterns and they see all the pieces come together, it makes it that much easier when we do these, these uh, fake cases, these case studies, these mock examinations. They feel much pre more prepared because they've seen all the pieces linked together. They talk about synthesis and learning. They're much more able to create and make sense and dose and choose the right interventions because they have seen all the pieces connected together. And they also feel like their clinical reasoning is improved. I think because when you develop the clinical patterns well, it gives you a platform to test their clinical reasoning, to develop their clinical reasoning. Um, I don't see it as a cookbook. I see it as helping them see the common types of patients that they're going to use their clinical reasoning to, to capture in the clinic. So they also talk about reduced anxiety in lab because they have the content early. They can watch it and practice it. If they feel like it's more efficient, they can watch it when they need it. And they feel like it's really helped them develop as a student clinician. A glimpse into the future. We are churning away building clinical reasoning games. So I've been wanting to do this. Think about for, my, for any of our courses, at the end of shoulder week, they will have three games to play. It's a choose your own adventure game, for those of you who remember those books. So you can see we have probably about 50 cases, probably about 70% of the way done. They take a lot of work. They're interactive. They're multiple choice questions. They nudge a student back on course when they make wrong choices. The patient gets better if they make good choices. The patient gets worse if they make bad choices. These games we are developing for the orthopedic, 
the neuro, the neuro and the cardiopalm and pediatrics. So all of these are in development. I'm hoping within a month we will have a bunch of the orthopedic games ready and ready for the students to utilize. So you can see I've been trying to solve the problem. The students, after they learn all this content, they need a safe place to play it out, to make some decisions, and to see how the results of the decisions plays out in the clinic. So you can see this is how we deliver the, the objective exam, all these exam findings, and they will be asked to make decisions about the outcome measure that the student came in with, whether this disability is high or low. So all these little things that we don't have time to teach in class, we're forcing them to play it through every game. They're going to play a very similar, similar flow. Here's the objective exam findings. Here's a summary. This is what we know so far. What would you like to do for treatment? Oh, I would like to mobilize her shoulder or mobilize her stiff elbow. Great, the patient got better. And you'll know that at the end of each game, I have told all of the team, we must create the second, the return visit. What do you ask? What do you determine for the irritability? How do you modify their dosage or regress or progress the intervention? Because these are all the common problems that we see in the clinic. I think we can solve that with some of these games. So that's coming. And for your, um, for your, law, your jurisprudence, your laws and regs, one of our students, and including some of our professors, said, it is so hard for our students, for us to teach this, and for our students to learn it well. And so what we've been doing at PhysioU is create interactive games that create scenarios in which questions will be asked that ask the student to apply the appropriate laws, regs, and ethic, ethic, ethical um, uh, beliefs. And when you actually finish, when you actually choose the right answer, it will, t or if you choose the wrong answer, it will share with you why you were right or wrong, and it will link you to the laws and regs. We are doing this for every state. So this will be something that you, your students will be able to, to utilize uh, this is a separate thing from the Physio U suite, but it will be something that you might want to consider for your laws and regs course as a way to really make the laws and regs come alive and prepare them if need be for their jurisprudence exam. So we have pretty much finished all the modules for California, and now we are marching along and finishing all the modules for every state because I do think this is a very important area that just is not, it's just really hard to teach. So that is, that's, that's in the pipes. So um, as we close out, uh, we are in partnership with many universities who are either using the apps or who are testing the apps. I want you to know that all faculty members have full access. We want you to utilize this in your classroom. We would love if that enhanced your teaching and made your life easier. I know it makes my life easier. Um, the cost to students, it's $54 per year. So any one textbook you get rid of, you've covered it for the entire program. But if students pay for, four, for three years, they get four years. So it takes them all the way out into their first year of clinic. What we've done for this coronavirus kind of crisis that we're in is we have decided to grant all faculty full access and all students have free access. So you don't even have to worry about can they afford it or can, can I utilize it. All students in the world have free access to all of our apps until June, June 1st, 2020. To get, and when we get to June 1st, we will kind of think through what, what is the right thing to do at this point. But what we want to do is enhance your ability to transition to online teaching we want to enhance your classroom, and we want to minimize the disruption for the students. We really feel strongly that this type of tool meets the millennials where they want to learn, and that we can really speed up the, the, the deep learning in the students. So I want you to know that your students, now in order to do that, you need to go to this link to sign up, because we need to one, figure out how many students you have, and figure out how many codes to send you. And I am happy at any point in time to jump on a call with you or any of your faculty colleagues uh, to basically 
helped in, help with integration. But I want you to know that the, the team at PhysioU is heavily invested in our profession and in the teaching and learning for our students. And we want to partner with you as you make that transition. So I, at this point, I'd, I would just like to um, thank you, open it up for questions or comments. We are here for the next, I mean, you're, I imagine all of you are now at home, but um, we're happy to hang out and chat. I just want to open it up. We will be having some other webinars coming up more specific to different areas. Uh, but for now, I will probably be one, running the same webinar for the next couple of weeks for people who haven't had a chance to see it. Um, but I'd just like to open it up. Manny, do we have any comments or questions or anyone can unmute themselves and just chime in? Sure. Mike, uh, Patricia Hill was asking, are there a collection of modality demonstration? Yes. Um, about two summers ago, because I used to teach modalities and it was so painful to keep demonstrating it, I did film pretty much all the modality setups. I just haven't had time to pull it all together um, and write the content. So, man, I, with all the apps that are coming down the pipe, I will try, I promise to try to get it out. Um, it, it's probably going to be summer. Um, I do have a lot of that content filmed. Um, I've actually been talking with my colleague David Selkowitz about pulling something together, um, but right now it's not available. I would say though that in many of our apps, you will see that, for example, here in Frozen Shoulder, that a lot of the guidelines already allude to the use of modalities. So I, I leverage this all the time. The guideline says, hey, for Frozen Shoulder, Shortwave diathermy is actually has some weak evidence for it. So here is how you set it up and what you do. And here's the link to the guidelines. So yes, some of the modalities are kind of in there, but they're just kind of tied to the conditions. I don't have the modalities app quite ready yet, but it's a really easy app. You can imagine contraindications, precautions, indications, and a video with a video of how to set it up. I mean, it's a super easy app to do. I just need, the uh, 27th hour in a 24 hour day. So next question from Jody Pfeiffer yes. is the research on the website as well. Yes. So wherever there is research relevant, they are actually linked directly to the PubMed abstract. So either it's linked directly to the site where you can download the guideline or the article, the abstract from PubMed is actually directly linked from the technique. A question from um, Jamie O'Brien. Is it okay to copy the link into a teaching handout without the students having to purchase the apps themselves? Yes. So because we have offered free access for everybody, this master checklist here is now available. So when you cut and paste this in, once you sign up, and we release codes to all of your students. When they click on these links, it will just take them right into the app. They will have their own login. They will have access to all of this content. And so um, we are, it will take us another, probably another week to fully complete all the techniques. A lot of it's being done, but ortho is just a beast. There's probably 3,000 techniques and treat. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, all of your, that's why we made it free for everybody. And I will say this, uh, if, if you feel like this is useful for your students, the, the, I, I think it's like f less than $5 a month or $4 and 50 cents a month. It's, uh, it, it's a very small investment for the tools that, that you might be able to use. Nevertheless, in this time of crisis, PhysioU has just offered it completely for free for everybody. So go ahead, Manny. Yes, Udak, I, I, uh, Epco Destin asks, can you show an example of a therapeutic exercise for the lower extremity? Sorry yes. if I am pronouncing the name incorrectly. Yes, so right now we are, in, we are in the final phases of releasing a therapeutic exercise app, period. So it will have all the common therapeutic exercises. In, in our orthopedic app, all the exercises are kind of sorted by here's Therex. So here's a quick access panel. So this is usually what 
faculty will use for their labs. So you have a bunch of mobility exercises, foam roll for IT band, foam roll for gastroc, hamstring stretch sitting, hamstring stretch standing, hip flexor stretch. So a lot of the common stuff that you would probably teach in your Therex class are all here because we've linked it to the conditions that have those impairments. So I hope that helps. Yes, and uh, Downs asked, uh, are there videos, are the videos dated as to when they're created or updated? They're not dated to when they're created or updated, but we are constantly re-updating based on faculty feedback. So we had faculty said, hey, you know what, your, your access seems a little bit off on this range of motion video. We went and refilmed five videos this on Monday. And so they're constantly being updated because the tool becomes cleaner and more universal as faculty given feedback. So. Gretchen Seif. Hi, Gretchen. How many lab assistants are you using for labs, i.e. what's the instruction, instructor to student ratio for the checkoffs? Oh, for the checkoffs, it is two students, two students or whoever that student is, because we're doing it virtually. So the, the student has a partner that they're doing the technique on, and there is one student TA on the other end of, of uh, whether it's a Google Chat or a Zoom or FaceTime. So it's, it's really just one TA to every, every two students. When it comes to the practical exams, it's going to be one faculty member and two students, and that's it for 15 minutes in a big room. Uh, we're hoping that we don't have to have to do that, but that's how we're imagining if we have to run the practical exams, eventually we're going to run it that way. Lori Boglia um, asked, does CAPTI have a problem with checkoffs via FaceTime? And then I think Justin Carrier uh, answered that question with, with uh, the most updated statement from CAPTI. Fantastic. Manny, do you mind? Did, did he actually say what the answer was? Sure. Um, can you see the chat right now? Uh, I haven't opened it up, but I can. Okay. But he says, um, under standard and required element 4N, the collective core faculty of a program are responsible for ensuring that students are safe and ready to progress to clinical education. The program is not prohibited from exploring a variety of ways to develop skills and assess for competence, including psychomotor skills for all required curriculum content standard seven. CAPTI believes that the program faculty are in the best position to make clinical decisions about student competence, including psychomotor skills demonstration. And the commission trusts that the performance assessment used by the programs will be effective assessing student readiness and safety. So that's an update from their guideline dated March 13. Um, so this is this is a more updated. Okay. So they loosened up the criteria according to Sam Coppoletti. Yeah. Yep. And then um, the next question I have is uh, from Jackie Kopak. Is there a way for a program to bulk buy a membership for a cohort rather than adding expense to them? Yes. In this hugely uncertain times. Yes, there is a lot of universities where we that we work with that they bulk purchase. So they PhysioU sends them an invoice and they bulk purchase it and all their students get, whether it's a one year or they want to just get the three years and get the fourth year free, they just bulk invoice it, all of their students get access and it's kind of built into as a as a expense, right? A course expense and it kind of gets covered by the um, by the financial aid. So if you reach out to me at mike at physiou.com, I'll be able to direct you to the person who works directly with faculty to help get that taken care of. A question from Rose Vallejo, is there a plan to incorporate movement analysis in the neuro content as an example using a framework from Shumway Cook for sit to stand? Yes, so we have actually quite a bit of movement analysis apps that we're working on. We're also uh, just today, or just yesterday, myself and our neuro faculty, um, Mary Hudson McKinney, uh, we have we we were planning to film the top five conditions for neuro, and film it from the subjective through the entire objective and testing, and the interventions and showing how the movement changes. We're going to film th those samples 
we're going to film it in the summer, of course, because the patients can't come in, but we're going to do that on real patients. And so there will be a movement analysis component. I think that's a tad out of my area, Rose, but I will bring that up to the team. I think, in fact, the neuro component of what we're building here will may potentially be one of the strongest components. Um, but your comment is well taken, and, and I'll relay that to the neuro team. And Marie Decker almost have a similar question. Are there any interview videos or videos which demonstrate a person answering a questionnaire and then have some limited application? Yes. So I will just give you a glimpse of what we are. I mean, just this morning, I was in touch with Sarah Kraft at MUSC. Some of the stuff she has created, we have now, we have now partnered with MUSC to bring it to our PhysioU allied faculty and programs. So you can see that she has a full examination, a, a full examination already recorded. So the students can watch a patient interview. They can watch a range of motion and tone and spasticity evaluation, and you guys can have discussions about it. All right, Malika, I'm going to see how much range of motion and kind of tone you have in your arms, and then I'll do it in your legs as well. So you just get to lay here and relax. This is the easiest part of the whole day. You don't get to do anything. I'm going to do it all for you. So first, I'm going to just see. So you have good shoulder elbow flexion. No Mark, are you sharing your screen? Your elbow extensors. Oh, hang on. Let me show you. Sorry. Let me share my screen. I mean, when I saw this, I said, you know what? Faculty all over the world need to have access to this. So here, what this is what she's created. And now PhysioU has partnered with MUSC to bring it to all of you. Here's the evaluation. Here is a subjective exam of the entire student, the, the, the actually this is a real patient. Here's the subjective exam. Here is the range of motion, tone, and spasticity assessment. The extension is also full. Hyperextensity in the knee extensors, really all the way through. I'd say a two, easy to move. So a lot of this, I hope, I mean, we are, we are expediting trying to figure out a way to get this to you faculty to utilize. So you've got the full examination, right? MMT, functional mob mobility observation, balance reactions, transfers. And you also have a number of the interventions all filmed. So uh, again, I hope that I'm, I'm trying to bring it to you as fast as we possibly can. Uh, she has done some amazing work, and uh, we hope to bring it to all the faculty. Man, I hope if we're lucky in a couple weeks. It just really depends on whether we can. I mean, everybody's IT team is completely slammed right now. Also from Rose, any plans to incorporate principles of motor learning uh, into the intervention? I believe so. I would have to. I, I'll have to kind of bring that up with the neuro team again as well. I, I just think we have to figure out how to do that right and then how to embed it into the apps. And she's also asking, I've noticed you created or are creating content related to PNF and RUD. Right. Any plan on task-oriented approach for the neuro? Uh, fantastic questions. Way out of my league, but I will, I will, I think so. Definitely. I think we're, we're going to figure out how to do that and how to create an interface to really make that useful for faculty. So, yep, all of those notes I'm going to bring to the to the neuro team. Barry Dale asks, where are the worksheets posted? Yes, if you go to physiou.com, so if you go to physiou.com, and if you go to educator under free resources, today's presentation in the PowerPoint version, which has hyperlinks, or the PDF. Here is the clinical pattern recognition worksheet that you can just download. These also have live hyperlinks to make it really easy for your student for you to utilize because the students will be able to click on it and go, oh, that's what you mean. Watch this video. Okay, so that's there. And then also the PhysioU master cheat sheet is here. So if you want to start embedding this into your labs, you can see that there are tabs, neuro exam, cardio palm, range of motion MMT, and all the techniques in a glance with the links for you to start embedding. I would say though that, that first, if you want to start using this, you really should go and sign up 
so that we can get you in the process of unlocking your students. Uh, usually what we do is we ask how many students you, go, you have, then we will send you a bulk uh, of unlock codes and then you can just distribute it to your list. We don't need to know who the students are. We just, we're going to give you the unlock codes. They can set up their own account. And that will make it such that once they click on any of these links, the videos will show up. And I also want to just note that, remember, as you're playing through these, these links, I think everybody does things a little bit different. A lot of it is probably good enough or a, a pretty standard, but if there are different little ways that you like to do things, range motion wise, MMT wise, special test wise, that it's good for you to augment whatever the video shows. And then if there's something that you think is actually wrong, we are absolutely happy when you send us an e email, take a screenshot. It's so easy for us to fix things. So we, we look forward to partnering with you to continue to, to refine this, uh, this tool. So Mike, you just answered Yu Jen Chang's question about faculty sign up for the class or individual students sign up. So that was the question. Yep. You, you, all you need to do is go to the link here, physiou.com slash coronavirus, and you will find a, a, a link for you to sign up and we can get access for all of you, all of your faculty as well as your, your students. Cheryl Einfeld just make a, made a comment, said, Michael, you're an amazing human and instructor. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Appreciate that. I, as you know, 17 years later, either you're crazy or you really love this thing. And I will tell you that there has not been a day where I have not adored being with my students and I have not dreamt of new tools to share with faculty and, and to really take this, take our education to the next level. And I'm, I'm so excited, delighted to be with all of you, uh, to be thinking and dreaming about what the, what the next generation of learning could be like. Hi, Michael. This Hi. is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. And I have been, you know, watching you build this for the last few years. I'm going. Yeah. I'm. I'm not going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> but you are so amazing, oh. and have been from the very beginning. And it's you're so you're like the ultimate uh, instructor, and um, you're just phenomenal with your ability to kind of read what's coming down the pike and build for the future of physical therapy education. Just incredible. Thank you, Cheryl. I remember chatting way back when. I mean, this has been a long journey and you'll see with all these different kinds of things that we're building, I've been kind of like chomping at the bit to take it to the next level. So a lot of the, I know. A lot of the conferences I go to now are tech conferences um, where big industry throws money at companies to try to figure out how to solve problems. And you don't see these kind of things at at PT conferences. And so I think it is really, it's kind of like reinvigorated me. And um, we have a, an, an engine of great people who we're collaborating with. And I would also like to extend the invitation to you as faculty, as you begin to see problems that we can solve, please reach out. I mean, that's my dream thing is hanging out with faculty and dreaming and building and, and bringing some of these things to life because the impact I think as you, I mean, even as you see in, in our apps, the impact, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to be big and all of these techniques that we're using now, we are already translating into multiple languages. So you can see here, all of our colleagues in China have pitched in and are translating because all of their students are stuck indefinitely. And so, um, I, we do have a worldwide vision. And we so appreciate the faculty support and the faculty feedback. Um, th this is, um, I have never taken a penny. Every single penny that comes into these apps go into the development and paying patients and development of new, new tools. So Cheryl, thank you so much for your support and your kind words. Thank Mr. you. <laughs> Misha yeah. Bradford asked, uh, will a recording of this webinar be available for later reference? Yes. I think you answered that. Do you have a code access immediately, like right now from UDAP, Destine? Uh, yeah, actually, I believe anyone who has signed up for this webinar should have gotten full faculty access. So you should have gotten an email that teaches you what is your login, which is your email, and what your password is. If you haven't received it, feel free to email me at mike at physiou.com, 
Um, but I would encourage you to, uh, I mean, even if you sign up uh, on the coronavirus website from our, from our PowerPoint here, um, you will be, you will have your full faculty access. And it, 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 probably by tonight you would have it. But I think our typical process is any faculty member who has signed up for this meeting already got an email saying, hey, welcome, and here's your full access. Please feel free to play. Cheryl was also asking, the other concern is accessibility. Are the videos captioned? We're working on it. So we've been studying TED Talks. We've been studying uh, what YouTube does. It is, it's a massive task, and it is on our list. Actually, we've hired a, a university specialist in terms of access to, for our redesign, in which all of these access issues are going to be addressed. We're in that particular situation. We're playing catch up, but I think at this point, we're all playing catch up. Um, it's it's a high priority. It's something that we're working on. Thank Tamara, you. you're welcome. Yeah, Tamara was asking, is there a general ICF category posting associated with this app? Um, I will. I can link a mini. I'm not sure what that question is asking. I mean, all of the apps, especially the orthopedic ones, are built around the ICF language. So you can see we've associated the patho pathology to the ICF category. If you're talking about a general mm, resource related to ICF categories, the only thing I have is a mini lecture that I give to faculty and other programs about these basic ICF categories, what are the examination and rehab strategies associated with it, and how it ties to the guidelines. I find that that is the most important thing that I do on the first day of orthopedics is I talk about the basic ICF categories because from there I reuse these categories and their theories for every joint. You have a knee arthritis, you have a hip arthritis, you have a stiff elbow, they're all mobility deficits. So when the student understands what happens to a mobility deficit and what needs to be done and how it's examined you are able to reuse these central themes to then drive the context and the basic foundational thoughts behind all these scattered scattered pathology conditions. So I can post that also on, uh, on our free resources. I'll make a point to post that. Aaron Schumacher was asking, what's the turnaround time to receive access code for our students? By the end of the weekend, everybody will be unlocked. So as you sign in and you tell us how many codes you need, we have the team ready to start unlocking faculty and unlocking students. So we have a lot of people who are starting class next week. Uh, I was just talking to a PTA director. She's like, we need this desperately. So we have her already all set up. Karen Bergbacher asks, will there be, a, will there be more videos for amputee case studies coming? The two that have video, videos are really great. Yes, actually, if you look in the Cardiopulm or in the Gate app, which is actually one of my favorite apps of all time, because we're going to use the Gate app as a template to create an app for functional movement, uh, something that we'll probably present next year at CSM. So um, imagine sit to stand, forward bend, return from bend, squatting, kneel, uh, 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 lunging, all of this can be phased out, critical events muscle activity, range of motion, all of that can be exactly the same format. I mean, that's why I built this app. But in the case of the, the prosthetic gait, um, the deviations, all of the common ones are already here. The, the fascinating part is these are all professors. And so the professor would come in and he would like, oh, I'm going to take the battery out. You need knee instability, I'm going to take the battery out. Or you need pistoning, I'm going to loosen up my prosthesis and, and do pistoning or I'm going to lengthen it. And so all of these are now here for you to utilize in the classroom already. Teresa Bisson asked, the request form for free access asks for institution URL. Yes. Could you clarify what URL oh, you Oh, just you your need? like apu.edu. We just need to make sure that you are from a university because we're trying not to, we're trying not to have this just every random person in the world ask for free access. We are really doing this for faculty and students. I think that's all the questions that we have.
Mike. Hey, fantastic. Um, thank you, everybody, for being a part of this. Um, I'm going to be running the same webinar next week. We will have a recording of this. I want to encourage you that we will all get through this together um, and that moving your classroom online, it can be done. The research related to hybrid and blended learning seems to suggest that it is there's no major loss. And so though it's going to be a little bit stressful, I want you all to know that PhysioU is here. It's ready to support what you are doing. And um, again, we are thankful. We're all colleagues. So we're thankful for what you are doing and the stress you're undergoing. Um, and we're happy to be your partner. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay at arm's length, as they would say. And uh, look forward to being in touch with all of you again. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Hey, thank you, Sam. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Manny, for being part of it. <laughs>